Well, good morning, everyone. We are so glad to have you here. You've been hearing me say that, but I say it because it's true. And you may notice I am not Steve Celo, but that's okay. We can still be friends. Uh, Brother Steve, he's taken some time off to hang out with his family. Many of you know uh, that his daughter recently uh, shared the good news with the world that they are expecting their second child. And, of course, he and Miss Tynell are so eager for the child to get here. They're up there a whole, like, nine months early to spend time with them. And so we're, we're definitely excited that they're able to go to Birmingham and spend time with family, as much of you have been doing, I assume, during the Thanksgiving holiday. Well, this morning we are going to be looking at the first half of Psalm 91. Psalm 91, one of the oldest psalms in the Old Testament. In fact, it's so old, and the Hebrew is slightly more difficult than the rest of the Hebrew, that we don't even know who wrote it other than God himself. And so we are going to look at some very real situations, some very real concerns that reach across history, even to us today, 2018, Jackson County, Mississippi. And so I do want to go ahead and throw out a few disclaimers. Number one, I know that you're tired because Thanksgiving wore you out. You ate way too much turkey. You bought way too much on Black Friday. And maybe you, like some of the rest of us, stayed up till midnight watching the longest college football game in recorded history and some of the worst officiating ever. But anyway, I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. I'm just telling you what happened. So, regardless, maybe you're tired, but I want to promise you we're not going to go into seven overtimes. Okay? You will make it, church. You will make it. But also want to share with you this truth, that the fear of the Lord... The fear of the Lord is what we need to hold on to. Not the fear of the world, not the fear of anything we may face, or not the fear of failure or disappointment or or anything that maybe you've experienced in this life. We need to hold on to the fear of the Lord. In Psalm 91, verses 1 through 10, I want to read to you uh, this statement uh, of what the the message is going to revolve around. It says, believers and non-believers alike will face difficulties in this life. Can I get an amen? You will face tough times, tough situations, decisions you wish you didn't have to make. All those things you will face in this life. And that's true for the believer, for the one who calls him father and is called son by the Lord Most High, and non-believers. You will face tough times in this life. But those who abide in Christ will ultimately escape the consequences of Of all sin. How about another amen for that? Amen. Amen. Not because of anything we've done or that we're good enough or have bought our way into heaven. We do struggle through our salvation, Philippians chapter 2. But it's because of what God has done. And it is better to suffer in the will of God than to die in disobedience. Remember, Jesus himself said that if the world hated me, it will hate you also. So never, never before should we ever say that with rose-colored glasses that if you'll just accept Jesus, you're never going to have any more problems. Okay, I think that is something that I've heard some people say, some very wise men and women uh, of God say that. And I say, well, I don't know if that's true. Jesus said exactly the opposite. I think we should say what he says. But we are promised we will never be left alone. We are, we are promised we're not going to be left out in the dark. Jesus himself says in John 13 that Satan himself can't snatch you from my hand. And so we need to fear the Lord, not the world. Uh, If you uh, do any reading, I don't know what you like to read. Maybe you like to read science fiction or maybe you like to read scholarly journals or whatever the case may be. I am married to a counselor. And so that means I get to read these delightful articles from uh, different journals of psychology and it makes my head hurt and all those things, and often she will ask my opinion about what do you think about this, and I'll say, well, once I look up that word and what it means, then I might can have an opinion for you, or I can Google it. Uh, But the other day, we were looking at an article, and it was titled, The Top Ten Fears of Humanity in 2018. The Top Ten Fears in Humanity of 2018, and it was from the Learning Mind magazine, and it was very interesting. And I said, oh, well, what's it going to be? You know, you always wonder, is it going to be like fear of spiders or snakes or, you know, something like that? Well, the top three fears were very interesting. Uh, The number one fear was fear of death. And I said, well, that makes sense. Number one fear, fear of death. This idea that our, our time here is limited, that seems to make sense. You would think everything is afraid of death. But the article went to say that the psychology of that's really more the fear of the unknown. 
that you really don't know what's going to happen. And so a lot of people, they really don't even like to think about it until they're looking beyond that, until they're at the end of their life. And then the second one was talking about fear of people. And I said, well, I totally understand that. People are scary. And it was talking about there are a lot of social anxieties that have manifested uh, because of social media. People try to get connected, but they only want to be so connected. And so they're afraid of being totally known, but afraid of not having any impact on the world. And so it's given rise to all these social anxieties. And they said that's one of the number one things people come in treatment for. They're worried about being in open spaces. They're worried about being in closed spaces. They're worried about being... In groups of people or being totally alone? And of course, number three was being totally alone, fear of loneliness. And the article went to say that we as humans, we want to connect. But we're so afraid of failing others and we're so afraid of messing up that sometimes we think it's safer just to not even try. And it was very interesting. The more I read that, the more interesting it was. And God had already put on the heart that this was the message for today. And so I said, wow, God, you're just showing me more and more of your power, your love, and the influence you have in our lives. Let's go ahead and read Psalm 91, verses 1 through 10. It says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say to the Lord, You are my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I trust. For He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His pinions and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. All those things God is saying you will not be afraid. A thousand may fall at your side. Ten thousand may fall at your right hand. But it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and you will see the recompense of the wicked because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. The Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you and no plague will come near your tent. And all God's people said, Listen, there, there are three very simple truths that I think we need not overlook, especially coming off of a Thanksgiving holiday. There are three things that we as the people of God, and perhaps you are one of those who you've come to church and you've heard all kinds of things because you grew up in the South, or maybe you're just visiting and so you came to placate mom or dad or the rest of the family. Uh, this applies to you too. This applies to you too. There are three things that we, whether you're a child of God, or whether you're someone who's just from the outside looking in, you need not leave here missing these three things. So let's look at them. Number one, our survival depends upon our proximity to God and His presence in our lives. Now this may sound like a no-brainer to most believers. They say, well, of course, I need to draw near to God. And Scripture promises He will draw near to me. And if His presence isn't in my life, if the blood of Jesus is not covering me, then I am truly lost and I am truly without hope. Well, the writer of the psalm, he makes it clear that that is the case, that God, He is our shelter. He is our refuge in a time of trouble. And one cannot be under the protection of God unless there's intimacy, unless there's a real relationship going on there. Now, many of you, you probably got together with some family over Thanksgiving, right? Maybe you saw some cousins you haven't seen in a while, some aunts, some uncles. Uh, at the Stewart household, it was a very interesting time because we had family together that hasn't been together as family since Tabitha and I got married like 10 years ago. So our parents got to see each other after a decade of never seeing each other. And so that was interesting to hear them talk. And of course, there were all different kinds of uh, family members and a few cousins and all these things. So it was great. It was an awesome time. But it was also an interesting time to sit back and see how everyone deals with each other. You know what I'm saying? It's always interesting to see how... Uh, Spouses handle each other over the Thanksgiving holiday and how uh, extended family handles each other during the extended holiday. But no matter what happens, and you might even say, don't let aunt so-and-so sit next to uncle so-and-so. Maybe that's how it is at your house. But regardless, I'm sure that at the end of the holiday, you looked around and said, these are my people. They've shaped me. They've made me who I am. 
They still guide me. Those of you who are fortunate enough to have maybe your grandparents or parents, you still ask them and laugh with them about things. You remember the good times, the rough times, and look towards the future together. That can't happen unless there's the intimacy of a relationship. You don't just knock on someone's door and say, hey, I'm here for Thanksgiving. Normally, you're invited, right? Normally, you're a close personal friend of the family or you're a family member yourself. Well, the same thing is here. We can't just claim the Most High as our shelter. We can't just draw near to Him unless we belong to Him. Uh, It's truly an amazing thing. When people hear you're a minister, they treat you a little differently. Uh, They might be cussing one minute or talking about what they're going to do on the weekend, but as soon as someone calls you Brother Dustin, instantly they become biblical professors. I mean, they know everything about the Bible. They swear they go to Ridgely Heights Baptist Church, you know, all those kind of things. And then when they hear you're from Ridgely Heights Baptist Church, they say, oh, well, that was three years ago before you got here. I'm like, yes, exactly, it was. Those of you who are counting, been here a little bit longer than three years. Brother Steve, it happens to him all the time. This is what's amazing. We are not under the protection of God unless there is the intimacy of relationship. Notice the wording here in Psalm 91. It says the language used uh, is dwells. He dwells in the shelter of the Most High. I will abide in the shadow. I will say to the Lord. That, that means like we are sitting across from each other. We are speaking just as if a husband and wife would speak, a father and son would speak. And also it says, I will trust that refrain. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Almighty. That demonstrates there is a deep relationship between God and us. This isn't a casual connection. This isn't just someone who you follow on Instagram and you like their posts. This isn't just someone you say hey to or you call them brother every time because you can't ever remember their name. This is a real connection because a certain covenant has taken place to bring us into the household of God. You know, I, one thing I, I really love to see is when families adopt a child. It is a beautiful thing, whether it be uh, because of divorce, there's my kids, your kids, and then when they come together into a marriage relationship and all of a sudden that mom and dad, they adopt each other's kids. How beautiful is that for everyone to have the same last name? How beautiful is that for a mother and a father to say, we love you so much. It isn't just you're our biological children, but we choose you as our own. And not only that, I've had several friends who they were, uh, their parents were, or their mom was contemplating uh, having an abortion, and yet they carried the child to term, and they were given over to the state, and then they were adopted by another family who wasn't able to have any children. How beautiful is it? And that's not a casual thing. That's a conscious choice on the part of the parent. And do you see here that God himself looks at us Us in all of our imperfection. Us in all of our mess ups. And he says, you, yeah you, I want you to be my son. I want you to be my daughter. I want you to dwell in my house. Abide in me. I want us to say to each other these things. I want you to trust me. That's how we're brought into the household of God. That's what Jesus was all about when he showed up. You notice he constantly talks about his father's business. And when people say you shouldn't hang out with these kind of people, like prostitutes and tax collectors and Gentiles and those who aren't uh, going to church every day, you know, Jesus says, no, those are the ones I came for in Matthew chapter 6. It is beautiful how God reaches out and he calls us into his household. But get this. That doesn't happen unless once we're called, we look to him and we really cry out to him, my Lord, my God. There can be no coming into God's house on your terms. I deal a lot with teenagers. And it's really interesting to remember their perspective. Uh, I've had some teenagers that were fearless. I'm talking they would run across the rooftops of buildings. Uh, they would set vehicles on fire. I love you, Forrest. You're my bro. Uh, It was just an amazing, amazing thing. And there were a lot of them that made a huge impact on my life. But one thing I always get a kick out of is when a a teenager says, well, this is how it's going to be, and my parents need to just figure it out. (laughs) Yeah, you're about to have a come-to-Jesus meeting, son. (laughs) 
and I'm not going to I'm not going to be refereed. That's going to be bad. But you know, sometimes we do the same thing with God. We all laugh cuz we remember when we were teenagers and we tried to tell our mom and dad how they needed to do things. But how many times do we try to walk into God's house and say, God, you should let me do this. You need to give me this. I'm calling the shots because it's Dustin's life or it's Chad's life or it's Miss Cindy's life or whatever the case may be. That's not how it is meant to be. When God calls us to follow him, he calls us to die to ourselves, So that when we are raised to newness in life of Jesus, he says, you are now mine. Above anyone else's. You belong to me. And you can dwell in my house. You ever heard that phrase? As long as you live under my roof, you'll follow my rules. Those famous words before you decided to move out because you knew everything. Then you figured out you didn't know anything. Right here, Christ is saying, I want you. And you need me. But to dwell in my house means that I call the shots. And you might say, well, wait a minute. This fear of the Lord thing, Brother Dustin, you're starting to make it sound like he's a dictator, like it's his way or the highway. I'm not saying he's a dictator. I'm saying he's Lord. And that means it is his way or the highway. We cannot be in his house without following his rules. John 15, 4, it says, Abide in me and I will abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you Unless you abide in me. You see, Jesus, he also spent a lot of time explaining the kingdom of God. He said, this isn't just a power struggle. He said, this is you fulfilling your ultimate purpose in life. He says, you were put here on this world for a reason. And unless you abide in me, you will never be who you were meant to be. You will never accomplish all that you were meant to accomplish You know, one of the biggest fears we had talked about earlier was fear of failure. This idea you're afraid of stepping out and trying, and so you might not ever step out. Church, you will never be the hands and feet of Jesus if we're too scared to go knock on our neighbor's door. We will never be the bringers of the gospel if we are too scared to be the husbands we're called to be, to be the wives we are called to be, to be children, to the parents. We are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And that doesn't mean just on Sunday from 8.30 a.m. to noon. It means that we are always connected to the Father, to that vine. And therefore, spiritual fruit comes forth. Also, Revelation 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. There is a direct promise from the Lord God Almighty right at the end of time In Revelation chapter 3 where he says, I will stand at the door and knock. Again, this house imagery. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. That is an open invitation from the King of Kings and Lord. And it's not just for those who've gone to seminary. It's not just for those who've been teaching Sunday school for 40 years. It's for you. It is for every one who's breathing at this moment on this earth. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. I love it. A lot of times people in the old, who talk about the Old Testament, they talk about God's wrath and His justice and how the God of the Old Testament doesn't match up with this Jesus of the New Testament that talks about love. But remember, Matthew chapter 6 is just a reverberation of Deuteronomy where God says, follow me, love me, and love people. And Jesus in Matthew 6 says the same thing. All the law hinges upon loving God and loving people. Here in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, it says, The Lord your God, He will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants. That's a precursor to the new covenant. So many times we look in uh, Jeremiah 29 where it says, I will establish a new covenant where I will circumcise their hearts. Because, you know, God's original plan didn't work. No, right here in Deuteronomy, when he first establishes Israel, he says the exact same thing. He says, the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants. That means our hearts will be changed in an instant. So that we may love him with all our heart, with all your soul, and with all your life. Rather than allowing the fear of the world to swallow us whole, 
when Christ Himself reaches down and grabs hold of us, and we're just awestruck with the fear and the wonder of the Lord, we are ushered into His presence. We are ushered into His family, into His house. And at that moment, we no longer worry about everything the world is throwing at us. There are a lot of things to fear in this life, granted. Failure. It is a scary thing to think that if you don't do your job right, you might lose it. Or if you're not the man or the woman you need to be, your family might not make it. You want to talk about something scary? Is If the Lord blesses you with children, that is scary. Because when everybody else had kids, you had all the right answers. But all of a sudden, when you have that baby... You're just praying every second, God, let me not break them. Let me not mess them up. There is real reason for fear in this life. But God's word points us towards a life free from fear of the world. One that is only lived when Christ lives within us and we are found in him. His presence makes all the difference. Not only that, we see while terrible dangers are a reality, God's absolute power and authority bring us hope. In verses 3 through 6, we see this beautiful shift in language. At first in 91, it talks about, I will say this and I will enter into the refuge. Verses 3 through 6 is all about what God does. It says, he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, the one who sets traps for you, uh, from the deadly pestilence. So he says, not even just someone who's trying to catch you, but even deadly disease, something that you have no control over. God will protect you from that. He'll cover you with his pinions. Under his wings, you will find refuge. It's this idea that God is standing between us and everything that wants to wreck us. So it's not that Terrible things don't exist. It's not that terrible things aren't possi a possibility here on this earth. It's that God, because of who He is and all that He can do, He is standing there as if it's a wall around us and the world. And I want you to think about this. If you really believe that God is who He says He is, if you believe that He is the author and finisher of our faith, that He created everything, if you really trust in Him to hold your salvation secure and to guide you and watch over your family, if we put our trust in Him, then what need we fear? Fear tries to cripple our faith while Jesus wants to bring forth power and love and a sound mind like it says in Timothy 1.7. We see where God promises us protection from evil, even evil that seeks us out. You know, you've always heard it said, you're not paranoid if they're really out to get you. And I'm sure you even have a few people. You're like, hey, that guy at work, i got to watch him. He's gunning for my job. Or I have to watch out. Uh, my teenager's getting sneaky, and so I really do have to be a little paranoid to make sure they're not sneaking out. Or whatever the case may be. But do you see that even if someone is purposely coming after you, like it says here, he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, someone who's literally setting traps, maybe even Satan himself who is trying to trick you, trying to tempt you. You see here that God promises protection from that kind of evil. Not only that, in verse 5, we see, You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. You know, a lot of times we're fearful of our own sin. I think the Christian is more aware of how messed up they are more than the non-believer. Okay? Because we've seen the ugliness of us and we know it exists. But this is talking about even other people's sin. Did you know that other people's sin affects you and your sin affects other people? Yeah, it's true. You have a dad that's an alcoholic, I bet it's affected you. You have a child that is totally going their own way and refusing to even acknowledge God. Guess what? I bet that affects you. Our sin affects others. Their sin affects us. And right here it says in verse 5, You won't fear the terror of the night as if someone was trying to break in or trying to harm you or trying to do something to you. Or even the arrow that flies by day, that random occurrence of just evil and terrible things that happen in this world to good people. What does it say? We don't even need to fear the fallen nature that's been brought about by sin in this world. Because God Himself holds us in His hand. Now again, it doesn't mean bad things won't happen. But when our fear is in the Lord, all of a sudden we're not so scared of all this other stuff. It looks like little stuff. You know, my children have a terrible fear of dogs. You know, it doesn't even make sense to me. I'm like, it's a dog. But to them, 
that German shepherd we have stares them in the eyes, and it looks huge. But my wife and I know that that dog just wants a tennis ball more than anything else in his life. And sometimes we see the things of this world like that. We see it and we say, that's big, that's scary, it's going to hurt me. And it's true, that might be capacity for damage. There might be something in this world that might actually bring you sorrow and might hurt you. But when you know who the Lord is, you look at that and you pet it like a puppy dog and say, no, I ain't going to worry about you. I've got him. So we see this. Not only that, we're not powerless when confronted by the very natural evil that we face every day. Verse 6, there's pestilence, there's disease, there's hurricanes, there's all these things. The destruction that wastes in noonday. Even the heat of the sun that can strike you dead because it's so intense. It says, guess what? God supersedes it all. God reigns above all of it because it's the world that He created. Sometimes we forget that, that God created this world and everything in it. It is His domain. And we see this throughout the names of God that are mentioned in Psalm 91. I know if in your translation you probably see names like the Almighty, the Lord, the Lord God, uh, the One. You know, all these different translations might translate the Hebrew differently. But there are four different names of God used in just these first ten verses. Uh, One of the terms given to God is El, the first way God is referred to in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. It is a generic term as if we were saying God to someone, whether you were speaking about the Greek gods or the one true God. You know, we use the term God. That is like the Hebrew term there. It's saying El. He is the very beginning. He is the very idea of God. The original. Not only that, we see the term El Shaddai, the all-sufficient God, the one who sustains us. We also see Yahweh, what comes out in Exodus, where the first time God says, I am who I am, and you are my people. That is the faithful God of covenant who will never let us down. Also, we see the term Elohim, the one that is used throughout the Israelites' tribulations in the desert, the one whose glory surpasses our imagination. You see, sometimes we get scared of things because they're unknown to us. Sometimes we get a little worried because we're not sure how things are going to turn out. But right here, we see four different aspects of God that assure us no matter what happens, He will sustain us and He will not leave us. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. So church, we don't need to fear. People, we don't need to fear, be so overcome by the things of this world that we lose sight of who we are and who we serve. We're following His will, and because of that, we're free to live a life of worship and fellowship with Him. Fear is driven out as we rest in His continual presence. You ever just enjoy hanging out with certain people? Uh, I'm not one of those people that is very uh, bubbly, but I love to be around people who are very interpersonal. Maybe it's because I, I'm not good at dealing with people, not good at communicating, but I love those people who just seem to walk into a crowd and know everyone. You know, like Mitch Osborne, you take him to Singing River Hospital, it's going to take four hours to get out. It's truth. It is truth. And some of you, I've, I've watched you as you interact with your brothers and sisters in Christ here, and you can walk into a room and you have the gift of exhortation. You're able to connect with people and build them up even though they might be feeling this high. And some of you, you're able to connect with new people and just love on them and demonstrate to them what the love of God looks like. That happens because you are so caught up in who Jesus is that you are living a continuous life of worship and fellowship with Him. The people you spend the most time around are going to be the ones that most influence you and they'll be the ones you most influence. So if we're following Jesus Christ as closely as we can, as we're staying in the shadow, as it says in verse 1, then guess what? The fear of the world is cast out because we're always in His presence. We don't worry about it because we look right next to us. There is Jesus. We're tempted. We look right next to us. There is Jesus. Our lives are in His hands for His glory and our good. Romans 8, 28, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and have been called according to His purposes. And the last thing we're going to talk about, in a corruptible world, God brings complete justice. 
You know, there are a lot of injustices in this world. We, we see uh, campaigns on TV all the time now that we seems like we have a different election every week, but we always hear about this candidate has these moral failings. This candidate has this issue. Uh, the nation has this problem, and only you can fix it by your vote. And we have all these different court cases that come up, and we hear on the international news about all these terrible natural disasters. And there are times we just say, God, if you're really there, why is this happening? And sometimes we're now finding out that the more you look at the news and the more you look at social media, the more depressed you are, the more anxiety you exhibit. It's almost as if the more we hear about how uncontrollable and how unjust the world is, the more we start to internalize it and say, there really is no hope. But right here we see, verses 7 through 10, that God himself remains in control and he will bring justice. He will set things right. It says, A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes, and you will see the recompense or the pain back of the wicked. Not because you're great, or not because you never mess up, but because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. Now, I don't know about you, maybe you have some legitimate fears. Maybe you're really afraid of something because of something you experienced in your past. That's not hard to understand. If you experience something traumatic as a small child or something happened to you, it's only natural that even now, maybe you're an adult in your 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever, you still have some fear because of what happened. But also, it's through experience that we learn not to fear something. Maybe you used to be afraid of heights, but then you started working and you had to climb telephone poles or something. And before you knew it, you said, 32 feet up in the air, that's nothing. It's not that the real reality of you falling hasn't changed. Gravity still is in play, folks. But it's because you've been there, you've done that, doesn't seem as scary anymore. Maybe the reason you've had to go through all the things in your life is now you can look around and see how Jesus has never left you. You can see all the things He's brought us through. And you can look at Him and say, Jesus, I've still got a, life to, a lot of life to live, but all this other stuff I used to be petrified of, all this other stuff I was worried about, all this other stuff I didn't know how to handle it, and I was at my wit's end, but Jesus, You've carried me through this. I was scared to death to be a husband, but Jesus, You brought me through this. Jesus, I didn't know how to handle this disease. And yet, here I am today because of you. God, I, the marital trouble. God, the struggles at night because I didn't know if my children were going to turn out okay. The money situations. God, all these things. We see Jesus has made all the difference. Due to the proximity of God in the life of the believer and the lifelong experience of His presence, those who call Him Father, are free to live their life without fear. Our experiences with the Holy Spirit begin to erase the fear of what this life may bring because we know what eternity holds for us. God demonstrates His sovereignty also by bringing judgment upon those who refuse to submit to Him. And you might say, well, that sounds pretty terrible that, that God would... Uh, cast some people out into darkness, as it says in the Scripture, and God would send those to hell who have chosen not to follow Him and have chosen to go their own way. And we've used this example countless times, but wouldn't a good judge, someone who is a morally good judge, uphold the law? Yeah. If someone was guilty of, of murdering someone or stealing from someone or burning a building down, if a judge constantly let them go, we would say that person has no business being a judge. They're not actually enforcing the law. They're not giving the victims justice. And yet here in Psalm 91, we see where God Himself says, if you follow me, you will be removed from all of this. Not that you'll be removed from the injustice, but you will be removed from the consequences of your sin. Not because of who you are, but because of what I've done on your behalf. My son Jesus has died for you. And the sad thing is that you might see others who don't follow me. And you will see them fall into the hands of a just God. 
who will leave them to their destruction and their punishment. And people, that's about the biggest fearful thing I can think of. Is that I fail as a parent and don't help show my two little girls who Jesus is. You know, you want to know about stuff that keeps you up at night? It's not about the money. It's not about any disease or anything like that. But it's the fear of not running the race that Christ has set before us. You know, may it be that when we close our eyes in death and wake up in Revelation 7, it says that we will see Jesus before us if we're His. And He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And throughout this life, some of you with gray hair, no hair, you know that there are good times, there are bad times, and there are tough times. But tomorrow the sun's going to rise. And our knowledge and love of God your, God, your love of God has grown over time, just like it has for your spouse and your family. And you know that you'll never get tired of knowing more about your wife. You're never going to get tired of knowing more about God. And not only that, our fear dries up as we are flooded with the love of Jesus. I want to read this quote to you from John Bevere. It says, Holy fear is the key to God's sure foundation. It unlocks the treasuries of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. Along with the love of God, it composes the very foundation of life. And we will soon learn that we can't truly love God unless we fear Him. Nor can we properly fear Him until we love Him. And church, that's what we hold in our hands. And that's what we carry out into the world. The fear of the Lord. That He is the one true God who will bring justice. The God who has created all things. But not only that. We hold out the love of God with our right hand as well. That it, it's only because God is who He is. That we're able to be who we are. And that we're able to live in this life without fear the world. Father God, we uh, 